Um, but a great deal has happened over the course of that time uh, for me. Um, I feel a bit as if I've been living my life in a, in a blur, um, a, a warm and encouraging blur, but nevertheless a blur. Um, and it's actually quite hard for me to recall what it was like not to be living in Sheffield. Um, as it happens, I've been back to Liverpool twice in the last seven days, uh, the first time a week ago today, for an event which just happened also to be attended by Archdeacon Malcolm, uh, who has also made the journey across the Pennines from that diocese to this one. Um, and after the event we were attending, um, we fell into conversation and he, he asked me how it felt to be back in Liverpool. Did it feel as if I had never left? And I heard myself say that on the contrary, um, it felt like visiting a city where we used to live um, and that Sheffield was now properly um, home. So I want to begin just by thanking you for uh, the way in which across the diocese I've been made to feel so very welcome over the course of the last um, couple of months. And I'd like to pay tribute especially to the members of the bishop's staff, above all to Bishop Peter, uh, for the way in which they've smoothed the path for me and leveled, leveled the way. Um, nine weeks has been plenty long enough for me uh, to discover what outstanding colleagues I have in the senior uh, staff team, and I'm immensely grateful to them. And thank you to all of you who have uh, been praying for me during this um, time. Uh, you may have say, heard me say elsewhere that I have never felt so much in need of the prayers of the people of God, um, but thankfully um, never found myself so frequently assured of those prayers, so thank you. Um, so this is, of course, my first diocesan synod um, in Sheffield, uh, and the last two months have been full of firsts. Uh, most of the firsts have been, um, for me, really quite encouraging and relatively glitch-free, um, but some of you will know that at my first licensing service in October, um, at a local ecumenical project in Darnall, I was reading the formal words of institution when my tongue briefly disengaged from my brain, and although I was completely unaware of the slip, the congregation heard me clearly say, Peter Jonathan, by divine permission, Lord Bishop of Liverpool. <laughs> um, if that's the worst mistake I uh, make as I negotiate this first 12 months, then I'll be a relieved man, and you will frankly have got off lightly. Um, I want to do three things in this presidential address, uh, if I may. I want to share with you some first impressions as I've begun to meet lay people and clergy around the diocese. I want to share with you at least a hint of what lies ahead in the next six to nine months. Uh, and then I want to return for a brief moment at the end to the theme of the sermon I preached um, at the installation in September by um, just uh, returning to the theme of generosity and our access to God's Holy Spirit. Um, so first of all then, some initial impressions as I've begun uh, to engage with the life of the diocese. Um, you may recall the prayer pilgrimage I made in the days leading up to the um, installation when I walked 52 miles from Rawcliffe in the Snaith and Hatfield Deanery via Doncaster, Conisborough and Rotherham to the cathedral. Um, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of um, having an idea which turned out to be an altogether better one than you realized at the moment when you had it. That's how I look back now on that um, five days. I set foot in 25 parishes in eight of the 12 deaneries. I shared in 16 acts of worship with between a dozen and 50 in attendance at each one, uh, including on the Wednesday, worship at St. Jude's Hexthorpe, St. Mary Sprotborough, and St. Peter's Connorsborough, which if you happen to know those parishes, pretty much span between them the whole breadth of ecclesiology and theology uh, in the diocese. Um, I was walking by myself only for one morning session. Uh, in all, I walked with about 40 other people, um, about a quarter of them ordained and three quarters lay. And it was such an effective introduction for me to people and places that I'm intending to do something similar in the first half of 2018 uh, to take in the four, four deaneries which I didn't visit um, last time. That's Woff, uh, Tankersley, Lawton, and here, um, Ecclesall. Um, 
Even in that week, I was struck by four things, and those four impressions have become firmer over the course of the past two months, and I want to share uh, these four things with you. The first is, honestly, an impression of quality. Um, it's clear to me that there are some extraordinarily gifted people uh, contributing to the life of our diocese, both lay and ordained. And it's been hugely encouraging uh, to me to see not just inspiring levels of commitment and dedication, um, good as that is, but of expertise, actually, and imagination offered in the service of God. Uh, the second is an impression of energy. Um, again and again, I found myself in places where there has been a buzz, um, a sense of, of purpose and ambition. Um, I think, for example, of the atmosphere at the Darsen Development Day uh, in October, or when I addressed a conference um, organized by our Darsen Board of Education for school leaders, that's head teachers and uh, governors, especially chairs of governors, um, or when I spent a morning with the School of Ministry, uh, or when I gathered some of the um, youth and children's workers and centenary project workers from across the diocese for an evening at Bishop's Croft. Um, these have been uplifting glimpses for me of what might be possible for us in the years ahead. Uh, but I've not been blind to the challenges. Um, in most of the acts of worship I've attended so far, um, the age profile has been sobering. Um, I thank God for every disciple of Jesus over the age of 70 um, who prays faithfully for the life of our diocese, attends parish worship regularly, gives financially and sacrificially. What would we do without them? But we do have a significant challenge in redressing the balance so that our congregations are more fully representative of the age profile of the communities we serve and in most places, that will mean, in the words of the uh, Darsen Development Day, growing the church younger. That's the third impression. Finally, I'm also aware of a level of exhaustion. Um, there are many around the diocese, lay um, and ordained, um, who, uh, in scriptural words, are weary and well-doing, um, carrying heavy burdens, sustaining a poor work-life balance, um, in some cases for too long, um, at some cost, um, clergy struggling to defend a rest day each week, uh, to take a full allocation of annual leave, that's not good. Um, lay leaders um, often either seeing precious weekend breaks from paid work crowded by church commitments uh, so that they return to paid employment tired on Monday morning, um, or in retirement juggling church ministries with grandparent duties and other forms of volunteering again uh, without due care for their own health and strength. Um, People thinly stretched, budgets thinly stretched, and thinly stretched things do tend to snap uh, if pressure is not eased in a timely way. Now, none of that is going to surprise you, I assume. Um, I did just want you to know that those are the things that have presented themselves to me, those four things, quality, energy, aging congregations, a level of weariness, uh, four initial impressions. So what about the next six to nine uh, months? Well, at the risk of stating the obvious, I want to work with the senior staff, uh, with area deans and lay chairs, uh, to maximize the quality and the energy on the front line, uh, supporting, encouraging, equipping, resourcing, releasing, while in refreshing the diocesan vision and strategy in order to address some of the key challenges that we are facing. Um, this isn't the moment to rehearse in any detail uh, the struggles that we face in the next 10 years. Um, the Diocese of Sheffield is in really good company. Um, the same four-headed beast is currently threatening every diocese in the uh, Church of England, um, some of them more imminently and urgently uh, than that four-headed beast is threatening us. Everywhere, finances are tight. Pretty much everywhere, attendance trends, despite our uh, focused efforts over recent years, are still falling. Uh, everywhere, buildings are increasingly not fit for purpose. Uh, and pretty much everywhere, there is a struggle uh, to recruit ordinands, especially for stipendary ordained ministry, at a rate that will compensate for those clergy who are imminently uh, retiring. We know all that, and there will come a time and a place uh, for us to consider those things uh, more seriously and more uh, thoroughly together. 
But, but in seeking to respond to that four-headed beast, um, we're not starting with a blank piece of paper. Um, there are now good things that we can learn from what has been tried and found fruitful in other dioceses, and we're also in a position to build on what has been found to be fruitful and good uh, in our own diocese. So, um, in refreshing the diocesan vision, um, starting actually at a residential with the senior staff team next month, um, I want to be asking in the course of the next six to nine months, especially in terms of those four challenges, what will a generous and flourishing Diocese of Sheffield look like in 2025? And because we're not starting with a blank piece of paper and because we want to build on what has already been found to be fruitful and good in this diocese, uh, it is already clear that the answer will involve the continued development of mission partnerships and what for shorthand we are calling the mixed economy. And for the avoidance of doubt, let me tell you what I think mixed economy means. It doesn't mean that some of us are, among the clergy are committed to sustaining traditional ministry and some of us are pioneers. All of us, lay and ordained, are now pioneers by default because of the scale of the challenges that we face. When I speak of mixed economy, I mean the increasing necessity in every mission partnership, if not every parish, of blending the old and the new in mission, which means four things. Traditional familiar styles of worship in traditional and familiar places like Holy Communion in the parish church, and traditional familiar styles of worship in new and unfamiliar places, like Holy Communion in care homes or school halls. It also means experimental and unfamiliar styles of worship in old and traditional familiar places, like messy church in the parish church, and it means experimental and unfamiliar styles of worship in new and unfamiliar places, like cafe-style worship in the back room of a pub. That's what I mean when I speak of mixed in economy. It means investing in the growth of existing congregations and investing in the planting of new ones, and it's a commitment that we all need to make to all of it together. In addressing that four-headed beast. There is no magic wand. There's certainly not one in the hand of a new bishop. But there are things that we can be doing to address each of those four big challenges, and there are things that we can be doing to ease the burden on lay and clergy leaders uh, in the meantime. And when I talk about, um, in the next six months, asking that question, uh, what will a, 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 a generous and um, a fruitful diocese of Sheffield look like in 2025? It's, it's really in order to, to focus together on what can we do in the face of those four big challenges, and meanwhile, how can we ease the burden on lay and clergy leaders? After that senior staff residential in December, in the first months of next year, I want to be consulting widely across the diocese on that question. What will a what will a generous, flourishing Diocese of Sheffield look like in 2025? Um, there, there is, I, know, I know that there is a danger that I will compound the weariness and exhaustion by asking you to engage with me in a consultation over that question, but I really can't see any way for me as a new bishop to understand what, how it feels for you without consulting with you. I can't see any way around it. So um, I'm going to be asking that question anywhere where I think the Holy Spirit might have given some insight. I'll be asking that question in church house. I'll be asking that question at Bishop's Council. I'll be asking that question here at this synod, but I will also be asking it as I come round to deanery chapters and deanery synods in the course uh, of 2018. What will a generous and flourishing Diocese of Sheffield look like in 2025? So you'll have to bear with me as we go through that um, exercise, and it might just surprise you. It, it might turn out to be a renewing process for all of, um, for all of us uh, rather than a, a, a further exhausting one. And that brings me back finally um, to the subject of generosity. I want to finish by reminding you um, that thinly stretched as we may be at this point across the diocese, the Lord is not. The Lord is not thinly stretched. His grace is as richly abundant as it has ever been. 
His gifts to us are bestowed as generously as they have ever been. In particular, God the Father pours out His Holy Spirit upon us every bit as lavishly as He has ever done. And He therefore calls us to deal as generously with one another as we have ever done. I hope you've noticed this, by the way, about um, the way the Bible speaks about the gift of God's Holy Spirit uh, to us. When, when the Scriptures speak of uh, the way God makes His Holy Spirit available to His people, it speaks of the Holy Spirit being poured out. Just think about that for a second. God does not dispense the Holy Spirit with a pipette, a drop at a time. God does not wire us up to some equivalent of a saline drip so that the Spirit can be meted out to us mill by mill. God does not serve out the Spirit like a barmaid might serve gin or whiskey, carefully filling a shot glass to the measure. God pours out His Spirit upon us in the way that we might upturn a bucket. So although I don't underestimate the scale of the challenges ahead of us in the next decade, least of all in those four areas I've listed, I hold on to this, that the Spirit of God is lavished upon us in enabling us to rise to those challenges so that we lack nothing that is good. And you will hear me continue to speak about generosity in the course of the next 12 months for this reason. When we know that our own resources are depleted and the challenges ahead are considerable, there is inevitably a tendency for us to become, if not mean exactly, then at least careful and maybe timid and maybe defensive in the way in which we use what we do have. But that is not the way of Christ. It's not the way of the kingdom of God, and I'm quite sure it's not the way of the Diocese of Sheffield. I'm sure I'm not the only one here who thanks God for the privilege of being called to His service at such a time as this, precisely in the face of these sorts of challenges. We are those who hear the words of our Lord Jesus, give and it will be given to you, good measure, shaken together, running over, poured into your lap. We are those who recognize the words of the Apostle John when he wrote, see what love God has lavished upon you, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. We are those who know, as Paul put it, that God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us so that we have hope, and hope does not disappoint us. This morning I want to say with you, thanks be to God for His indescribable and extraordinarily generous gift. Amen. Thank you.